It's my pleasure to welcome you all this evening. I know we'll have others coming in later, but let me at least start the introductions because they always take longer than we want them to do. This is part three of the Global Film Webinar Series on Racial Violence and Colonial Accountabilities. It's made possible by the New School for Social Research. My name is Anne Laura Stoller, Professor of Anthropology and Historical Studies at the New School. And I'll be introducing our wonderful filmmaker and our three star discussants. Today is the last in the film series. That's for this year anyway. We don't know what's gonna happen after this. It's been a stupendous and moving set of events. The first film was by Rob Lemkin titled African Apocalypse, which took us to the massacre by French colonial soldiers over a century ago, largely recounted by several generations of current citizens of Niger, demanding that the killing be brought before the General Assembly of the United Nations as human rights violations. And they were there for the film. The second, based on the film Meeting the Man, James Baldwin in Paris is, was a close and is a close up of the caustic relationship between Baldwin and the filmmakers who were intent to cast racism as a minor detail rather than the focus of what Baldwin had expected, an expose of his relationship to racism's virulent presence in America, why he fled not for the charms of Paris when he wrote and for today. And tonight is Rico Spates, Rediscovering Fanon, a dark and dazzling film on Franz Fanon's life as writer, militant, poet, clinician, revolutionary until his death in 1961, that views contemporary anti-Black racism as Rico has put it through the lens of Fanon's prescient, revolutionary writings and through the synergy between his practical work as a psychiatrist, his grounded concept work, both sources of his unique radicality and resonance across the world. There's no one whose style of thought has shaped such a broad set of struggles, fields of knowledge production whose language as conceptual arsenal has been called upon to reckon with the conditions racisms produce and their effects. And just the concepts alone would be wonderful. We could spend the whole time on them, on um, combat breathing, living death, reduction to a pho phobogenic object, target the duress and colonial durabilities of which Algeria and his own Martinique were his most intimate examples. It really takes a precisely defined optic and a bold craftsmanship to broach Fanon's effect and Rico's speech has both. I think it takes courage too, given how much Fanon has become both icon and fetish in ways I imagine he would reject. I think Rico's film is in another category. The logic and passion of his film mirrors the logic and defiant passion, both of Fanon and the surge of those that refuse to not be heard today. So let me introduce our cast of speakers whose interventions will follow the film immediately. Each have extensive bios. We've all agreed that they're too long to read all of. I'm gonna make them short. Please don't be offended. If you wanna know more, they're all available on Google in many forms. Rico Spate has a diversified career. I start with him in producing, directing, editing, and writing um, for film, theater, television, and digital media. His documentary, Who's Gonna Take the Weight on African-American and Black South African Youth, was screened at the Cannes Festival, Film Festival in 1999. His earlier documentary, The People United, which profiled the reaction of Boston's Black community to the murders of Black women in Boston, just was invited to join the Pantheon of acclaimed films acquired by the Criterion Collection, which I listen to and watch all the time. Among his many theater directions is the live, multi-genre stage production of Amé César's A Season in the Congo, presented by Le Mans. Renee White, 
exemplifies the joining of scholarship and commitment to higher education and to making sure that racial and gender equity are not just talked about, which we do too much, but realized and that they happen. She is co-editor with Lewis Gordon and Deanian Sharpley White Whiting, Whiting of Fanon, a critical re reader, one of the earliest and most important collection on Fanon's work and life. There remains a standard of Fanon's scholarship has been re-edited so many times. She also just happens to be <laughs> the provost and the executive vice president for academic affairs at the New School, where she is a sociology professor. Yes, yes. Among the four books, I can't go through all of them. She has edited our two of particular note here, Spoils of War, Women of Color Cultures, and her second, Revolutions and Afrofuturism in Black Panther, Gender Identity and the Remaking of Blackness. Well, Lewis Gordon is a master radical philosopher and a notoriously prolific man. He is, as he describes himself, an Afro-Jewish intellectual, academic, and musician from Keep, don't you, don't you really? Yes. From musician from Kingston, Jamaica. He's taught across the globe in countries ranging from Australia to Brazil, to France, to Jamaica, to South Africa, to the United Kingdom, to the United States. He's the author of so many books, I can't go through them, for which he has received accolades, such as the Gustavus Myers Award for Outstanding Work, probably the most important on human rights, and the Eminent Scholar Award for the International Studies Association. Two of his many books include What Fanon Said in 2015, Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization, actually I'm listing three, 2021, and this year, Fear of Black Consciousness, listed on Literary Hub's most anticipated books of 2022, and it seems he's been interviewed every other week by equally leading figures in Black studies. And finally, we are honored to, to have with us Camille Robis, professor of French and history at Columbia University, who comes to us with another book whose widespread attention is so well deserved. This is her disalienation, politics, philosophy and radical psychiatry in post-war France that builds on intensively archived and ethnographic work to look at some of the most influential racial cultural theorists of our century, including um, Guttari and Fanon himself, to explore the relationship between psychiatric and political practice. So I hope these brief Biographic notes are enough to give you all a sense of the stellar interlocutors we have before us. Let's go to the film, Rediscovering Shen. Are we all there? <laughs> the moment to breathe? Um, Rico, could you start us off? Sure. Well, first of all, I think we should apologize for the uh, poor image and sound quality fidelity of the of the zoom screening that's our uh, fault a Thank lot you. A, a lot was lost uh you know in translation so we start there but otherwise i'd like to thank ann for a very passionate uh introduction which uh, i appreciate it both to the film and to us the people that are in it and so uh, i appreciate this opportunity this film um uh, what you saw i mean well what we have now is like an 80 minute rough cut so that's what we have what we saw was a 38 minute screener um, that kind of comprises scenes from that full story and this particular cut focused on the film's actual opening and it builds to george floyd's tragic murder and it also introduces fanon's theories of uh, the tension between the various bodily schema the overall goal of this film, Rediscovering Fanon, is to examine racially polarized America through the lens of Fanon, which Anne has said earlier. And in so doing, the film makes a strong statement about the contemporary relevance of Fanon. And I, I'd like to, you know, I talked to some of the things that motivated me. Most of the quotes are from Black Skin, White Mask, but uh, in a different context, 
Fanon argued that racism bloats and disfigures the face of the culture that practices. That really, that speaks to me because that's what I see, that's what I'm living. Um, the, the film, however, focuses a lot on black skin, white mass, this first book, which he wrote at 27. And here, Fanon offers a profound analysis of the alienating impact of racism on the lives of black people and society at large. A lot of people miss that second part. But for me, it's the both. It's the, you know, the alienating impact of racism on the lives of black people, but also on society at large. And that's what motivated me to want to do the film mm -hmm. because I feel that that's being taken up. Uh, Fanon underscores, uh, I mean, this film is to underscore Fanon's notion of the peril of black bodies in the milieu of anti-black racism by revisiting contemporary tragedies, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Philando Castillo, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and others. And in the introduction to Black Skin, uh, Fanon writes, I believe that the fact of the juxtaposition of white and Black races has created a massive psycho existential complex. And I hope by analyzing it, to destroy it. He says, later in the course of this essay, we shall observe the development of an effort to understand the black-white relation. The white man is sealed in his whiteness, the black man in his blackness. We seek to ascertain the direction of this dual narcissism and the motivation that in inspired it. Uh, he adds, I believe that only a psychoanalytical interpretation of the black problem can lay bare the anomalies of effect that are responsible for the structure of the, that complex. And the analysis I am undertaking is psychological. In spite of this, it is apparent that the effect of disalienation of the Black man entails an immediate recognition of social and economic reality. So that's always there. Uh, in chapter one, Black Skin, uh, Fanon says, it is necessary, I like this, he says, it's necessary to say certain things. And so I'm speaking here on the hand, on the one hand, of alienated and then in, in quotes, duped Blacks. And on the other hand, of no less alienated, duping and duped whites. Yep. The temporal foundation of the film, though, is Fanon's life from 1925 to 1961 and interviews of uh, his close family members, his son, his daughter, a niece, uh, a first cousin, playmate. Fanon's character is revealed. Alice Shirky, also a practicing psychoanalyst who was Fanon's intern at Blida in Algeria, also reminisces about Fanon's uh, psychiatric practice and his revolutionary politics. In the first part of the film, uh, we look at Fanon's growing up in a Fort de France Martinican family and alludes to the fact that at 18, he enlisted with the Free French forces to fight against the Nazis. After World War II, he studied medicine and psychiatry at the University of Lyon. And it was in France that he received his first lessons, his first rough lessons in living abroad as the other. And he describes the confrontation between the I, meaning the first person singular of a black man, and the I, E-Y-E, -E, of the white world in a gaze that objectifies black subjectivity. So this film incorporates conventional documentary strategy. It's hard to see from what we saw, but anyway, it, can, it, it incorporates conventional documentary strategies, you know, voiceover, talking heads, B-roll. But as we have seen, Fanon's black skin, white mask, which is what attracted me in the first place, is so bold and audacious and reflects Fanon's hybrid readings and interests. He's wildly writing and thinking across disciplinary borders. So the film is also kind of a free form essay grounded in Martin's third cinema aesthetics, fragmentation, montaging interviews and archival footage, recreations, voiceover narration, on-screen quotations, reenactment, and so forth to illustrate the hybrid nature of Fanon's oeuvre. In chapter two in Black Skin, Fanon writes, this work represents the sum of experiences and observations of seven years, regardless of the area I have studied, one thing has struck me, the Negro, enslaved by his inferiority, the white man, enslaved by his superiority, alike behave in accordance with a neurotic orientation. And it is this dual neur neurosis that is a major theme of the, the film. Another important theme is the notion of bodily schema, which is raised in chapter five, you know, in, like in concentrated way. 
And that's well explained in the film by Professor Lewis Gordon, who is the, is the documentary's primary humanist narrator. In the fifth chapter, Fanon writes, below the corporeal schema, I had sketched the historical racial schema. The elements that I used have been provided for me by the other, the white man who had woven me out of a thousand details, anecdotes, and stories. So Fanon introduces a dialectic between the corporal schema and the racialized epidermal schema. And, and also he introduces this idea of being locked in the body, which also Professor uh, Gordon uh, speaks about in the film. Uh, ultimately, uh, Fanon, but it was ultimately in the film and in my own uh, understanding of him, it, it's his humanity that's the last word. Every man, every time a man has contributed to the victory of the dignity of the spirit, every time a man has said no to an attempt to subjugate his fellows, I have felt solidarity with his act. So we began uh, the production phase of this film in 2007, if you can believe that. A close family member of mine connected uh, with an associate of Aimé Césaire's. I was trying to get an interview with him. So we arranged that. Um, that was to take place uh, at the City Hall in Fort de France. But as it turned out, the interview was canceled at the last minute because Mr. Césaire became very ill shortly after we arrived in Martinique. And, uh, but nevertheless, as fate would have it, and unbeknown to us, the translator assigned to the shoot was Michaela Roja. And she it was, is what she was. She was Fanon's grandniece. Single-handedly, she rescued our visit. She introduced us to Franz Lynn Fanon, her mother, who's also a, a practicing psychologist, and to Fulbert Fanon, which is the, the first cousin and child playmate I mentioned. And then in 2011, when the Caribbean Philosophical Association came to Harlem to the Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz Cultural Center for one of its closing sessions at that convention that year, I met Professor Lewis Gordon, one of the conference organizers, and also Mireille uh, Fanon Mendes Franz, who's a featured speaker, guest speaker then. And those connections were pivotal, very, very pivotal in making this film. Uh, one of the formidable challenges, however, has been fundraising. Wonder why. And after receiving support early on from NISCA, which is the New York State Council of the Arts, after that, contributions just basically dried up. Things became really dire. And in frustration, I turned to other projects during the interim, including uh, producing a multimedia theatrical production of uh, Césaire's A Season in the Congo at La Mama. But eventually, after a moderately successful Indiegogo campaign in which we raised 10K, we did begin receiving individual donations again for the documentary, small, medium, large, ranging from $15 to $1,500, and a few even larger, you know, 1K, 2K, and a couple of 5K donations. But the real turning point was 2021. One of the aforementioned 5K donors stepped up in a really significant way. His name is Ron Ashford. And his contribution more than double any other foundation grant or individual contribution we'd ever received. So we consulted a lawyer and then offered Ron the position of executive producer. He accepted and uh, he's been hand on, hands on ever since. He's hosted Facebook fundraisers and parlor events to raise funds, attracting additional individual donations, some as large as 10K, at least one. And for sure, it's been a long, long project, practice, struggle, and journey. But with Ron's leadership and the help of comrades and supporters, we're getting there. Ultimately, we hope that this film will be for, it will be for all audiences across generations, demographics, national boundaries. And it's a film for theatrical release, TV, PBS, cable. We're interested in any and all distribution outlets, ranging from the Smithsonian Channel to Netflix to HBO to whoever. And we're also expecting that the, that the film will be used by activist organizations. We've already worked with some, including the Franz Fanon Foundation, the Caribbean Philosophical Association, Black Lives Matter, Crispus Attucks, and we've already screened trailers at the, uh, the Wright Museum in Detroit, University of London, Dartmouth College, University of Connecticut, and others. And we believe this project to be extremely timely. And we've seen, I've mentioned that there have been numerous mainstream cultural references to Fanon's work uh, of late. Uh, for instance, currently on the Black Agenda Report on their website, there's an article titled, The Work of Franz Fanon Guides Anti-Imperialist Thought and Action 60 Years After His Death. 
Also, a review of Wretched of the Earth came at the end of last year, year in, the, in the New Yorker. A lot of people saw that. And then uh, Manola Dodges, uh, when she reviewed the film Passing, which a lot of people saw, the title of her review was called Black Skin, White Mask. So, you know, it feels like it's everywhere. You know, there's a thirst. Uh, but in any case, I'd just like to end by saying, you know, that we are a nonprofit independent production. Third World Newsreel is our fiscal sponsor. That's TWN at TWN.org. And our production website is Rediscovering Fanon, all one word, dot com. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. and thank you all yeah. of the discussants, and thank you all of the people that are listening. And again, we apologize for the fidelity issues. Thank you so much, Rico. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing this film with us. Um, let's move on quickly, right? Renee, please. Well, thank you. First of all, um, Rico, thank you so much for the work that you've done and your, you know, clearly intrepid, um, dedicated, focused commitment to the story in the way that you want to tell it. So just to you and your team, um, just kudos. And thank you so much, Anne, for the invitation. I am really so happy to be here. And I feel, um, I must admit, a little bit ill-equipped to be with such incredibly um, expansive thinkers and um, you know, contributors to understanding in a deep and personal way, Fanon. Um, so I think I actually wanna start with that, sort of the deep and personal relationship that I have to Fanon scholarship. Um, so I was first exposed to him um, and his work in college. I um, uh, found my way into a graduate theory course, um, and the my um, uh, advisor and mentor um, thought that it was a, the right space for me to be in. And in that class, um, we read Black Skin, White Masks. And to say that it was a transformative moment for me um, as a, a young um, Black woman, Afro-Latina from the Bronx at a elite institution, is um, uh, not an overstatement. It truly was a moment of like the scales fall, falling from my eyes. And what I really, I really um, what, what I noted was the connection, the sort of through line um, that I saw connecting Fanon's sort of framework that helped me to understand things that I didn't understand or was struggling with, you know, in a predominantly white institution um, and the books that were in my home. So, you know, I grew up with Kwame Ture and, you know, with the autobiography of Malcolm X and um, Manchild and the Promised Land and, you know, Tony K. Bambara and all of these, these incredible, you know, tomes, which my family would usually say, please don't read that to make sure that I snuck and read it. Um, and, and it worked. <laughs> and, you know, but as a, as a young, you know, 19 year old, I was 19 or 20, um, I suddenly realized, you know, how those sort of revolutionary texts and the moment in time when they were written was uh, built on the foundation and inspired by and connected to Fanon's work um, himself. And, and it really also showed for me, you know, how as a social scientist, I can link the structural phenomena that I was trying to understand with the individual experience, that they are inextricably linked. Um, that telling the story of one person can be done within the context of social forces that have an impact on them. Mm -hmm. So part of what really I resonated with in this film was that that's the, the family story, right? The, the human element, the human story about Fanon, who was a human, who was just a mortal, despite the incredible sort of legend and impact that his work has had, and the way in which our own stories and our own narratives shape our worldview. And it made me want to know more and really hear more. So I'm really excited about this, getting to hear more from all of these family members who have an insight into the evolution of, of idea and thinking in a way that um, is different from, I think, what um, you know, a lot of scholars might might surmise, but I really kind of connected to that. I connected to how family shapes and how your specific moment in which you live um, has a profound effect on the ways that you think about social questions and sort of, you know, commit yourself to, to understanding them. 
Um, another theme that really struck me was, you know, and, and you said this too, Rico, was, you know, uh, thinking about schisms and rupture and duality and how, how much that is a formative component of Fanon scholarship, that there's always a tension, right? Um, and, you know, really trying to understand uh, what creates those tensions and those separations, but also what reunifies and brings you back together. Um, and and I, I, I have always found his work to be grounded very much in the moment in which he was writing, very much in the moment of revolution and unrest, um, and also so transcendent and so relevant to um, any time. And I find myself often bringing Fanon into all sorts of work. So, you know, the recent project that I, I've done on Black Panther, I kept thinking about Fanon and thinking about him in relation to particular characters and the ways in which they were approaching the question of what does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be a free Black man? Do you do it within the systems that you have? Do you do it using the tools of the state or do you resist that? And if you resist, do you need to do it using violence? What is the role of violence? And is violence liberating? Is violence corrupting? So I saw all of those questions in, in in um, the film and in, and really very much connected them to uh, Fanon as a framework and as a way to, to ask uh, what I think is really important. So a couple of other things that, uh, you know, from Fanon that I have found to be, you know, really important tools um, in my own work is really, um, you know, approaching the question of anti-Black racism um, as a kind of pathology, pathology on the the psyche, a pathology on the body, it has an effect on your health, pathology in terms of the social body, the corpus, um, so that in many ways in which it is um, uh, uh, pathologizes and is pathological and is um, a dis-ease on our nation. Um, and so that anti-Black racism, of course, has an impact on people of African ancestry, but as you know, Fanon makes very compellingly clear the ways in which it is um, a, dis a, a disruptive and, dis and a destructive presence on the white corpus, um, whether or not that's, that's seen. And, um, and so I find myself sometimes being rather impatient when, you know, um, in moments of, of violence um, and racialized violence at the hands of the state that people express such surprise that these things can happen. And I wanna say, you know, so clearly you've never read Fanon who had been talking about this. Um, you know, how can you be surprised that we live in a nation built on anti-blackness, built on chattel slavery in which the state is empowered and and the agents of the state use um, capital and labor and violence and propaganda to further their ends. So you have to be disingenuous at best to be so shocked that we live in a system in which the stripping away and dehumanization of black people is a fundamental tenet of our, of our, um, of our founding. Um, and again, Look to Fanon. He he has um and he's not a magical you know uh, stone or a magical sort of um you know rune, but but certainly there's so much in there that you can relate to and connect to um, to understand our dynamic social forces. So just a few quick other things. Um, you know, part of what I really was struck by in the in in this film is the way in which intellectual work is a communal thing. Um, that intellectual work um, um, it ties you to and makes you obligated to people, right? Um, and that, um, and it made me also think about if intellectual work is communal, what does that say to us in the academy? You know, what does it say to think about the, the ways in which, um, you know, not only anti-Blackness, but other structures of inequity and injustice are replicated within higher ed? And what do we have to do to dismantle it if we were to take on an, a Fanonian a sort of analysis or vantage point to do that? Uh, I, I was reading um, uh, uh, some materials that I, I, I often do about Fanon, and this one um, really struck me um, from um, Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. And it says, quote, Fanon's radical humanism, a humanism made in Césaire's famous phrase, to the measure of the world, sustains a capacity to speak with real power to, the, to many of the ways in which the question of the human is posed and contested from within contemporary forms of grassroots militancy undertaken from zones of social exclusion and domination. And so I wanna close by um, just talking a little bit about the real day-to-day -day lived um, power of his scholarship and that notion of um, radical humanism. So last week, this is wild this happened. Last week, I, I chose to take a cab to go somewhere I would normally go by subway. 
And um, I was talking to the cab driver and, um, and he was telling me about where he was from. And he said he was from Algeria. And then we started talking about, you know, um, just his experiences in the United States. And I said, oh, you know, you know, the scholar that I'm really such a huge fan of, you know, Frantz Fanon. And um, that led to a maybe 10 or 15 minute conversation about how important Fanon was to this man, how important it continues to be to Algerians, um, the ways in which he, um, this driver, really thought about um, questions of citizenship, um, questions of um, identity, sort of state ide identity, um, and how citizenship, and this is something he said, citizenship is con conferred by the same state actors who sanctioned dehumanization and, eras and erasure. The conversation was so powerful that when he got to where I was going, he pulled over, he turned off the meter, and we sat there and we talked for an additional 10 minutes. Now, for a New York City cab driver to do that, you know, that tells you the sort of day-to-day -day power and appeal of this man as a scholar. So I will I will end there, but just again, thank you so much. Um, you know, again, Rico, for, for this very evocative and thought-provoking text that really, you know, led me to think and make so many connections, much more than, you know, I'll be able to share right now. Thank you, Renee, thank you. Um, Louis and then Camille, we wanna make sure we leave some time for um, those people in the audience to ask some questions. So thank you very much, Louis, please. Thank you, Annie. Uh, we know each other for a while, so I say Annie. Yeah, thank uh, you. Ujambo to everybody. Shalom, assalamu alaikum. Uh, you know, um, you know, a bonsoir. And uh, I throw some little South Africa in there. So bona, which is another way of saying hello, which just simply means I see you. I see you. Uh, very briefly, first thing is, uh, you know, Rene was holding out a little. Rene, Rene is the, the uh, the VP, you know, at uh, the New School, but her background is heavily rooted in a lot of issues you see in this film. Uh, we go back to doing a lot of work in the streets, particularly New Haven. And as I was watching it and looking at Renee, I was just thinking about those streets. We were there dealing with in New Haven, the police, the period of the varieties of ways in which neighborhoods were mm. attacked, all of that. So, I was just, I want to add in there because it connects to Fanon in an important way, which is we have a lot of uh, uh, profoundly, almost textual, uh, disconnected ways of talking about Fanon. And maybe one of the reasons we talk about Fanon the way we do is because of what in French they are called intellectual engagé, you know, the connected, committed element. And so I just wanted to put that out there. Also, this is the 70th year of the publication of Penoir Mass Blanc, right? Black Skin White Mask. There are people talking about all over the place. And I think connected to Camille's work, uh, you know, it was originally called the uh, Disalienation, you know, de noir, right. on the disalienation of the Black. And it was funny because I started off today in a doctoral defense for a political theorist, Greg Dukas, where we were talking about disalienation. So this is something that's on our minds quite a bit. There's also the reality that Fanon, well, basically uh, goes so directly to issues of truth that the antidote for those who want to keep the system is as we see even with the attacks on critical race theory to defend falsehood. Unfortunately, sometimes the people who present the falsehoods are not simply the external in the black white binary, sometimes it's internal. I think about that terrible piece that Anthony Appiah wrote for the New York Times on Fanon that was just full of gossip and falsehoods, just one false statement after another. For instance, he described Fanon's home as a kind of palatial bourgeois estate from the family. And as you can see in the film, as Rico walked through the home, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know for black, what black folks would call middle class, a lot of white folks would call shacks. <laughs> you know what I mean? When I would think about the way my, uh, when, growing up in the Bronx, Renee and I are both people who grew up in the Bronx. Uh, so Bronx in the house. The thing to bear in mind that when we say, well, you know, we, when black people just talk about certain issues, you're gonna have to add in today's economy, 50, 60K onto that 
for white folks even to start saying middle class. So all of these efforts, these misrepresentations is wonderful that this film is coming out where people could just see what the reality is. And some of the misrepresentations also connect to some issues around how we'll talk about Fanon and even in terms of how people misread him in contemporary popular culture. For instance, people who see the Black Panther movie actually think Killmonger is the Fanonian character and that's absolutely false because Killmonger creates a false dilemma. He basically says, conquer or be conquered. And Fanon's whole work is about the false dichotomy of that. Mm -hmm. In other words, the kind of violence imposed by colonialism is to close off the imagination. So we have to understand that there's a third way, which is why not fight to get rid of a world premised upon conquerors and conquest? And that was not the Killmonger option. But in a way, when we think about it, what we're to do, our task, our generation's task, is to create something better. Now, just two more points, and I would love to hear from Camille. One thing I did uh, notice in the film was that the, main, the, 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 the intellectuals in France kept referring to European thought as all Fanon had, and that's actually false. Mm -hmm. And one of these way, one of two ways to think about it is we have to understand, and you could see when we saw Martinique, that there it's it's really an Afro-Francophone society. Mm -hmm. And Fanon grew up speaking Creole. And Creole is a very relational language. It's not a language of possession and things. And that's crucial because when Fanon was a medical student, he couldn't separate the person from the cadaver. And this is crucial because when you think about people, in other words, there's dignity also in death. And this element, when we're dealing with violence, when we're dealing, when we look at these films to see the effort to make people into death, this is an insight that Fanon didn't get from Europe. He got right. it from the animated reality of what we understand, not only in the Caribbean, but also parts of Africa and other areas of the global South. So it's very important to think through what creolized languages have to say. And finally, I love the fact that we began to, you know, that it was really brought out very well there that, you know, right now, I know there's a lot of people, one of the fetishes, the exoticized stuff right now in the academy in particular is Afro-pessimism. But Fanon, a lot of people, and they try to claim Fanon, but Fanon argued not that the white, that white supremacist, that construction of whiteness was the human. Fanon argued that if you push people above human and you push people below human, you have killed humanity. In other words, we have to fight for a world in which we get rid of people propped up as gods, the way those police officers were, the way the legal system structures things, and we also have to get rid of this malediction to which there are people who, who, who are, are forced into the idea that they're below human. That in other words, humanity matters, not in a very romanticized sense, but in a very sober, mature sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more that could be said on that, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Lewis. You go to Camille. Thank you, Lewis. I want Camille, if you don't mind, I just want to say one thing um, before I give you the floor. And actually, that really relates to some of your work. Um, I, I think for me, over 40 years of studying colonialism, it's that it is Fanon, in some sense, that allowed me to do the kind of work I did on being white, on imagining and creating the community of what it was to be European and the fictions of it. And it's incredible because so much of the work now is not about being white or it's about whiteness, but actually about that interiority, the pathology of that space. And it's why I've studied for so long and I, against so many of my dear left friends and you know, what it is to read along the grain of the logic of racism not only against it, but actually to understand its interiorities. And, um, and I feel it's Fanon is one of the few who says, you've got to get right. The pathology of what it destroys in people who imagine themselves as white. The imaginary is not only the radical imaginary. The imaginary is part of the most insidious part of the security state and the imaginary of the 
phobogenic, right, object that becomes someone who is black. So I just I just want to say that he he acknowledges that, but he also incites that you don't just stay on one side of this this Manichaean divide. Thank you, Camille. Please. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Anne, for the invitation. Thank you to my to my fellow panelists, and and especially thank you to Rika for directing such a provocative and powerful film. Um, so I wanted to focus my comments today on three questions that I think run through the film and that have also preoccupied me in my in my own work, especially in the, my last book, Disalienation, in which I examined Fanon's relationship to institutional psychotherapy. So I'll say a little bit more about what institutional psychotherapy was. Um, but for the moment, let me just say that it was a movement of radical psychiatry that was associated with the figure of François Tosquelles, who, who Louis mentions in the film. And, and perhaps I think uh, Fanon's most important mentor, intellectual mentor. Uh, so the three questions that I wanna think about are first the, about the psychic effects of racism and colonialism, which you really see um, in the past, but also in the present. Um, the idea that psychiatry could be used as a form of political agency, that, that psychiatry was politics. And finally, just a last very short word about the reception of Fanon's work in France and in the US because I think, again, it's something that comes out in the film. So uh, on the first point about the psychic effects of racism and colonialism, this is clearly um, one of the lines of the movie, the juxtaposition of past footage on Fanon and decolonization with our current situation and the, the racial justice protests of 2020. Um, and I think the back, this back and forth in the film is very interesting and also very important to illustrate how Fanon understood the psychic effects of colonialism and racism. Mm. I think... I think here Lewis um, summarized it very poignantly when he said that for Fanon, the question was not what's wrong with these people, but what's wrong with the system. Um, I think it's important because Fanon had a deeply structural understanding of racism. And I think this was linked in part um, to his structural understanding of subjectivity, one that came from psychiatry and from psychoanalysis and from this particular um, current of institutional psychotherapy that he was so kind of um, involved with. So, here, I think it might be helpful to say just a word about Fanon's training in psychiatry. Um, it, it also comes up in the, in the film because as, 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 as Rico told us, the black skin white masks was originally his medical thesis. It was famously rejected. Um, but Fanon studied medicine in Lyon and chose to specialize in psychiatry, a field that was, ter that was still very much dominated by a kind of organicist and neurological approach to mental illness. Um, apparently it was called a psychiatric desert that was hostile to any input from social psychology or psychoanalysis. And so on the one hand, Fanon was very attracted by this kind of um, empiricism. He, he kept this love of empiricism throughout his life, but he also quickly became convinced that he needed to look elsewhere for to understand the significance of the social environment in the development of the self. And this is where he turns to all these sources, anthropology, phenomenology, existentialism, Marxism, mm -hmm. but also psychoanalysis. Um, and I think for him, all of these fields allowed him to construct a subject that was not defined by biological essentialism or by brain chemistry, but by the social, by social conscious and unconscious relations that were forged vis-a-vis -vis others. So all of Fanon's early works, in some ways, Black Skin, White Mask, but also his essay, The North African Syndrome, and even the medical thesis, the one that was actually accepted, <laughs> um, they all wrestle with this question of psychic causation. Like, how exactly is it that we interiorize these social phenomena and what, and how does this become a pathology or not? Um, we see this very well in Black Skin, White Masks, where Fanon points to the limits of mainstream psychiatry, uh, also to the limits of, of obviously a very strong critique of colonial racist psychiatry. But what's interesting is that he also kind of goes through all of, through various other theories of race and racism and sort of t puts them apart, or criticizes them one by one. Um, so first, he, it's obviously a very strong critique of abstract universalism, what we would call today colorblindness, right? That the, and you see this in the film again, um, where, he, where Fanon is, kind of takes his distance from French integration. It's also a very strong critique of negritude, um, something that Fanon will, will, will criticize, a movement that Fanon will criticize throughout his life. 
And finally, of Octave Manoni's psychology of colonization. Um, for Fanon, both Manoni and Negritude remain trapped in a kind of essentialist understanding of race and of the self. Um, so I think this, all of this is one of the reasons why Fanon was so excited to discover institutional psychotherapy. Um, in his work, you often see it as social therapy, but it's basically the same thing. And, and the work of Tosquelles, who that and he chose to become a resident at the hospital of Saint Alban, where Tosquelles worked um, as soon as he finished medical school and before he headed to Algeria. Uh, one of the theories of institutional psychoanalysis was that alienation was always social and psychic at once. So that you had to understand disalienation along those two axes, right? You could not just, um, Tosquias used to say that Marx and Freud were the two legs of institutional psychotherapy. Like when one walked, the other had to follow. So you needed not Marx or Freud, but Marx with Freud together. And, and perhaps the best way to, 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 to explain institutional psychotherapy was this possibility of imagining within the limited confines of the hospital, a philosophy, a social theory, and a clinical practice that could prevent the chronic reappearances of what Desquay is called concentrationisms, um, but also racisms, any all the, the tendency of all institutions and all of subjectivities to become authoritarian, hierarchical, closed off, right? All institutions have this potential, all subjectivity. So how do you do this? And, and, and I think if we Keep this in mind, disalienation was not a kind of endpoint, but a constant work of pro work in progress, right? It's almost like an ethics, a practice of everyday life, something that you need to constantly be rethinking. Mm -hmm. And this was a very important insight for Fanon that guided his medical practice at Blida and later in Algeria and later in Tunisia where he worked until his death in 61. Um, so this leads me to the second point about um, psychiatry as politics uh, and, and basically as a vehicle for disalienation, so a kind of psychic disalienation and social disalienation. One of the goals of institutional psychotherapy was to turn the hospital, um, the hospital that was kind of known as a carceral and an oppressive environment, into a healing collective. Uh, the French term was a collectif soignant, right? So how, so how would you do that? How would you turn something so oppressive into something that could heal people. And so this was really what Fanon was engaged in in the 15 months residency that he, that he had at Saint Alban. He organized group meetings, he plays music festivals, he set up art and workstations that included pottery, painting, weaving, ceramics for the patients. He also contributed to the hospital's um, newsletter or journal that it was called Hyphen, Très d'Union. And, and all of this was in the hope of creating, of generating new vectors of transference for the patients, but also for the hospital staff, because the idea was that you needed to cure everyone. And I think this leads us back to, to what Anne was saying. It's not, you know, it's, it's not just curing the pathologies of everybody. Everybody is alienated and everybody needs to be disalienated, including in this case in the hospital, the doctors and the staff. And I think this idea of a healing collective is also a very um, important access to read Fanon. Um, and it's not the one that we usually hear because we always hear about violence in Fanon. Um, right. and of course, of course, there's violence in Fanon, but I think there's also something about that the violence is almost the first step to um, to what comes after, to the process of reconstruction of healing. Right. Uh, the, the importance of, and I think for for this idea of the collective is very. It's, it's almost like the idea of, of of recreating a common, recreating a common for all of us. Um, so Fanon basically brings. Oh yeah, I, I think I'll, like the, 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 the violence in Wretched of the Earth that Fanon preaches, I almost read it like a kind of electroshock that he, that he was also very interested in because it's kind of the right. moment oh. of violence, but yeah. then, then, then the process has to begin anew, right? It's not just a violence for violence's sake. Um, so Fanon brings institutional psychotherapy to North Africa, but he quickly realizes that it's, while it's having very positive effects on the European patients, it's not working at, at all with the, his North African patients. And he writes this fascinating piece with one of his interns where he basically tries to come to terms with the, the reasons why this was failing. Mm. And what they, what they conclude is that what they were trying to do was to impose a Western grid, a Western psychiatric grid on Algeria, what he calls an imperialist psychiatry even though institutional psychotherapy was the most progressive, most leftist, mm. um, most radical current that was happening in France at this time. And so Fanon concludes that instead of adopting what he calls a policy of assimilation, psychiatry needed to embrace a revolutionary attitude. And the point here was not to kind of go back to a, a traditional Algerian society that was untouched by the past, 
but rather to kind of invent, to, to, to take into account this irreversible transformation of colonialism and to invent new institutions. And so I think we can, we can draw really interesting parallels uh, between the ways in which Fanon wrote about uh, politics and the wretched of the earth, especially about national culture and the ways he treated institutions in his clinical practice. Mm. Um, both were, both were, kind, were, were forms of disalienation or vectors towards disalienation. Now, as, some, as people who have read Fanon know, um, what, what Fanon means by national culture is not exactly, it's never exactly clear, um, but he spends much of the book telling us what it's not, right? And it's not a simple return to tradition or a naive glorification of a past that's untouched by colonialism or cut off from reality. That's one of the problems that he sees with negritude. Um, instead, it's 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 some it's a kind of I think national culture, if I'm reading it correctly, is a kind of theoretical framework grounded in the past and in local tradition, but radically oriented towards the future. Right? Yeah. It's culturally specific and yet universal, and it can serve as an instituting vector both for subjects and for the social more more broadly. And so again, I think there's very interesting ways to, to read these two things together. Um, the, the, the psychiatric practice that Fanon continued throughout his life and his more political works, even those that are not explicitly psych psychoanalytic or psychiatric, um, but all, both work as tools to combat, um, to, to, to help us figure out how exactly you decolonize. Mm. And one Thank tiny you. last word. Oh, can yes, I say I'm one last word? sorry, Camille, I thought you were done. Oh. One last word about the reception of Fennel's work. I just have one, one last yeah. thought because I think, I mean, I think so. The, the, I'm not going to say anything about the U.S. reception because I think the movie shows it very well, um, the, the importance in the civil rights movement. But I think that the, the French rediscovery of Fennel in, in Martinique and in France is very, was extremely interesting in the film. Um, and a few years ago, it was still very hard to find Fennel's writings in French, but today exactly they're all- Exactly what I was going to say. Thank you, Camille. You couldn't, you couldn't find them anywhere. And now no. they're all available in an excellent right. edition, in excellent editions uh, by La Découverte. But I, I think this has to do- to Oh yeah, exactly. That one and then the Achille Mende anthologies. I mean, they're, exactly. all, they're all great. But I think this has to do with the kind of the difficult history of race in France, um, race as a lived concept, but also race, uh, but race as the lived reality, but also race as a concept. And this is something that again, Anne has written about extensively. Um, but it also has to do with the fact that there's a whole new generation of scholars and of activists who are okay. finding tools in Fanon's corpus to talk about race, decolonization and disalienation. Okay. And obviously the impact of Black Lives Matter in France and in Martinique is, has been extremely important and I think extremely exciting. Um, and, and I think in my, in my own book, what I was interested in was also the kind of erasure of Fanon's name in the history of institutional psychotherapy, which I thought was also very surprising because he had written so much on psychiatry and yet he's never kind of thought in that genealogy. People always say, oh yes, and there was Fanon, but why is he not more central? Um, and so I think in some ways, what, what, by, 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 by looking at Fanon in, in this genealogy of, of institutional psychotherapy, um, and seeing how he himself took institutional psychotherapy one step further, in some ways made it more radical, deterritorialized it and transformed it. Um, we can see he forces us to decolonize intellectual history and to also rethink the supposedly European parameters of the history of medicine, of radical psychiatry and what is generally referred to as French theory. And I think, you know, just to, let, to end on this Rico cinematic techniques, I mean, I really like the way that you described it as modernist third world cinema, because this is something that struck me as I was watching your film. Um, you know, th this perhaps is an example of the kind of dis decolonized, disalienated aesthetics that Fanon would have precisely kind of preached, you know, or, or, or supported. So I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kabian. Yeah. I mean, I think there is something really uh, in terms of logistics of what American audiences actually had access to, and it's very limited. It is two books. And in fact, the writing of Fanon in French is this up close detail of everything he was doing day by day with everyone he was working with. And it's such a crucial part, as Camille says, of actually the profile of what he imagined the world could be. And I think that's kind of warped in some way, I mean, you've really brought it out, Camille, but it's really warped what, what, what we get from him, how much the, you know, what Bachelard called the epistemology of detail was actually- There were, 
crucial yeah. to <laughs> politics and radicality. So let us yeah, open okay. this, if we may. Oh, uh, did you want to say one thing, Lewis? Before oh, we no, I was going to go to the three questions that were there. But, yes, please. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Um, the, the 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 first thing first of all first thing though is earlier there were three books because there was the collection edited by Jez, you know Joseph de Blay or Josie Fennon, his widow, and then there's the recent uh, alienation freedom which is actually a little bigger than the French version right. that came out, but but uh, the questions were the first one was wanting to know about that point I made about the elimination of the human because of constructing the white above the black and want to know which text. So you could see it in black skin, white mass. You could see not only, but especially in the seventh chapter. And in terms of, you could also see it in the first chapter of the Dagne de la Terre, or, I mean, people know it's the wretch of the earth. I don't like that translation. I prefer to just say the damned of the earth for a variety of reasons I could spell out later. The other one was how to get the film and Rico is gonna, could talk about that. Uh, uh, another question wants to know about where that Apia article came and that was in on February 24th in the New York Review of Books. Okay, so that, and I sent, I put links in the chat to those. One, uh, one of the, two, two other things very briefly I'd like to add to what Camille said. Fanon actually trained to be two kinds of psychiatrists. He trained to be a clinical psychiatrist, but also a forensic psychiatrist. Mm. And this is very crucial it's, it is, there's a lot of psychoanalytical stuff to say there because I already mentioned that he couldn't basically dissociate the, the person from the cadaver, but he ended up having to do autopsies when he returned to Martinique. And it's a very crucial issue here because we often think about Fanon in terms of how he deals with the violence in the streets, but he also dealt with bureaucratic violence and domestic violence because yeah. there's a special case that Ali Shirky talks about and many others. In when he returned to Martinique, and uh, and just and just very, very briefly also, if we're thinking about his thesis, it's very clever. It, it was interesting how clever he was because the one he did submit that he got the degree for was on Friedreich's ataxia, and this is where the right. body just shuts down. But in the analysis, exactly what Camille was saying, he raised the question of how medical, right. Um, basically healthcare workers would treat a patient in a situation like that. He began to deal with a holistic That's conception right, the of detail. therapy. Okay. Um, I, I, I would like to invite people to not only ask questions, but if you have a comment, if there's anything you would like to say, we are absolutely available to you and would love to hear your questions or comments or anything of any sort. Sometimes it's so hard with webinars, right? <laughs> no, another one just popped up. It says, Good. greetings. Uh, will there, one person would like to know, will the recording be made available? And some of the ones that were, were uh, oops, let me just do it right. Oh, it says. We have two yeah. minutes left. <laughs> oh, okay, this one says, Fanon was clearly invested in exploring the limits of the body. How might Fanon's conception of the body, especially the black body, inform our understanding of digital bodies? Mm -hmm. mm. Do we think Fanon would see the digital reconstitution and free movement of black bodies in virtual space as potentially liberatory? And then an anonymous attendee said, I just figured that way we have them on, the, on record. Thank you all for Rico Spade. How has black storytelling influenced the cinemata graphic strategies used in your documentary. And then finally, there is, oh, there are two more. There's Professor uh, Rebsis mentioned that it isn't clear what Fanon meant by national culture. Uh, just very briefly ahead of time, there, there are some wonderful discussions on the question of national culture that you all could look. I highly recommend looking at Jane Gordon's Creolizing Political Theory. She looks at it in detail. And I also talk a lot about it in what Fanon said. But what can we hear more about that point? And Emeka Nwad Diora, uh, what would Fanon say about Ukraine and Russia today? I just figure, oh, and then, and then just, uh, um, good, so good. We got, we got those at least on the record since it's recording. Right, I, so, think, I think we're almost, almost uh, out of yeah. time, but let us please. Yeah. 
Okay, so so perhaps perhaps Renee, uh, you would like to say something about some of those. Well, I you know I'm thinking about um, in particular the question of um, the limits of the body and the concept conceptualizing the body, and you know, and I think about. Um, the use, and this is something I've always been interested in in um, some of his work, sort of the role of technology and liberation. And um, if we were to kind of translate that to a contemporary form, you know, the power of um, digital spaces to, you know, create and define oneself beyond the, the boundaries of um, society or social forces or, you know, physical space. There's a kind of liberation, um, I, I do think you know, um, in these digital spaces. And so I would imagine that he would be, you know, quite interested in everything from the use of technologies to document injustice, to the use of technologies to create um, communities in which you can define yourself and represent yourself in any way that you see fit. Um, and the ways in which um, that kind of digital definition of self is an actual liberatory kind of practice. So I, I absolutely could imagine him being very engaged in that kind of inquiry. And um, certainly in terms of the, the moving beyond the limits of, of the body. Rico, do you have something you might like to add to? No, I mean, the only thing I would say uh, in terms of the black storytelling question is just this, this idea of first, second, and third cinema. And so that they, that, you know, you reject these others, the more Hollywood model, the, the, even the O'Toole model, and you get to this third model, which is third cinema. And so out of that, a lot of, um, you know, uh, some Bain and all these filmmakers, I mean, it's in that tradition. So in that sense, it's a good question because it does link what we're doing in terms of this third cinema aesthetic to wow. black storytelling. And Camille as our. Yeah, just about national culture. I mean, I think this links very well to this question of aesthetics that we were just ending with, because I think what I, what I, I mean, I lose this, uh, I think the, the, uh, there's a lot of great writing about this, but, uh, but, uh, but um, Fanon spends most of the time telling us what national culture it's not, is not, right? So it's not, it's not, as I said, a kind of application of a Western model. He has very strong words against the assimilated intellectuals. It's also not, um, uh, a, as I said, a return to a kind of untainted past. Um, it's, it's not like negritude, Arabism, tribalism. Um, and and um, so the, the few examples that he gives are things like the storyteller, um, the things like artisanship, wood carving, ceramics, pottery, which I think is interesting because these are all activities that were central to institutional psychotherapy, again, in the hospital. So I, I, I think that in some ways you can really see how his practice was so connected to his political work. And it makes sense because you know he's he's dictating his 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 books like Wretched of, of the Damned or of the Earth, or sorry, Damned of the Earth or Wretched of the Earth in the mornings from seven to nine and then seeing patients all day. So he, you know, it's I think in some ways you can't really dissociate the two at the level of the praxis, but also at the level of the theory. They're very kind of, they're very interconnected. Um, so in, in some ways, I think the fact that there's no specific content gives us also the, the freedom to think of this as a, as a template that we can fill with, with, with different things. It's not, there's not a roadmap that we have to follow to disalienate or to decolonize. It's really about figuring it out as, as we go along and never getting too settled, even when you think you got there. Uh, I, I, well, I, I, th oh. Oh, I would just briefly add to that, that what Fanon would also point out, that national culture is act, the way Fanon looks at it is actually linked to what makes any community modern in the sense of part of a global intersubjective communicative practice. In other words, the whole purpose of colonialism is to relegate certain people to the past. And if one is going to transcend that, one has to have living culture. And there are elements that would require more time that connects to mm -hmm. stuff that's connected to Rousseau's general will and things mm -hmm. like that. But one just brief thing is thank you, Rico, because you see, one of the things is this film really needed to be made and it's needed to be made uh, and your commitment, your, your, your hard work, all of that and the communities rallying about it, around it. That is something that I just wanted to just acknowledge and celebrate. So thank you so much for doing that, Rico. Well, I also thank want you. to say thank you, Rico and Lewis for the synergy between the two of you yeah. and how that 
work in the film and what it's just, you know, animated in all of us who are here. This is not the end of a conversation. Thank you everyone in the audience for sticking with us, for being here with us. It's been really wonderful and I hope it is only the beginning um, of us thinking together about why this matters so much. So thank you thank all. You. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you again. Au revoir tout le monde. Bye. <laughs>